grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text today, as we begin a study of the prophet Jonah from chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. <clears throat> Daniel may have been in the lion's den, but Jonah has long been in the critic's den. You think of the story of Jonah, and what do you think of? A whale of a tail? A really big fish story? Or do you think about how critics of the Bible, unbelievers, ridicule the story of Jonah? How ridiculous that a man could survive inside the dark, stinky belly of a fish. But our Lord Jesus, on the pages of the Gospel, spoke of Jonah as a real, historical person. And Jesus spoke of what happened to Jonah as a real, historical event. And that is enough for us. But there is far more to the miracle of this book than merely the story of what happened to Jonah with the big fish. 
The book of Jonah is essentially about how God goes looking for people who run away from Him. Lost people. Like a gracious God seeking out the lost people of Nineveh in that heathen empire. Or seeking out a stubborn prophet named Jonah. Or how God comes looking for you and me. Now why does God come looking for you and me? Because we run away. You heard stories when you were a kid about, you know, children who run away from home. Toby Tyler runs off to join the circus. Or Tom Sawyer runs off with Huck Finn to an island in the Mississippi. Or a mistreated orphan named Oliver Twist goes seeking his fortune in London. The Bible tells about people who ran away. Adam and Eve ran away from God. Jesus told a parable about a prodigal son who ran off to the far country of his own rebellion. Sometimes we run away. Jonah did. This is the start of the story. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Jonah has an assignment, a call, if you will, from God. To go to the great heathen city of Nineveh, capital of the cruel Assyrian Empire, to preach against it and to call them to repentance. Jonah declines the call. He says, no, and he heads in the opposite direction. Now, why would he do that? Put yourself in the sandals of Jonah the prophet for a minute here. Jonah lives during the time of the so-called divided kingdom. After the death of King Solomon, the nation of Israel came to the brink of civil war. The nation split Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Jonah is a preacher up north during the days of King Jeroboam II. Now, during the reign of King Jeroboam II, things were actually pretty good. There was territorial expansion. The economy was booming. People were happy. But God was not. King Jeroboam II promoted the worship of false gods and the party animal behavior that went with it. God was not happy with the people of Nineveh. And so Jonah, along with prophets like Elijah and Elisha and Hosea, were sent to call God's Old Testament people to repentance. And Jonah and the others, they thundered about God's gathering storm of judgment on the horizon. The Assyrian Empire the superpower of its day and cruel would be the sword in God's hand to punish wayward Israel for their sins. So you can understand why Jonah would not want to go off and call the Ninevites to repentance. Why in the world, he thinks to himself, would I run off to that heathen empire and warn them that God's buzzer is about to sound on them, what happens if they repent? What happens if God relents on his judgment and spares them? Then they will survive, and they will survive in order to carry off the northern tribes of Israel into captivity. You can almost hear Jonah saying something like, Really? Are you serious? And so Jonah understands what a desperate situation this is. 
We get it. The Assyrian Empire was one of the cruelest empires in ancient times. They flayed their enemies alive, stacked up the heads of their enemies on the city gates, and they piled up bodies like cordwood to die, and they hacked off limbs and arms and gouged out eyes and burned little kids alive. The entire book of Nahum in the Old Testament is devoted to God's judgment upon the ancient Assyrian Empire. The epitaph at the end of the book of Nahum puts down the epitaph. Who has not felt your endless cruelty? And sure enough, some three centuries later, when Alexander the Great passed by the ruins of Nineveh, he didn't even recognize them. You see, superpowers come and superpowers go, and the Lord of Nations moves them about like chess pieces on his chessboard to do his will. Rudyard Kipling, British poet, warned his mother England in his famous recessional poem that it can happen to any nation when all our pomp of yesteryear is one with Nineveh and Tyre. Every nation, including our own, needs that warning. So this is why Jonah does not wish to go off to preach to the people of Nineveh. He figures there are just some people that you shouldn't preach the gospel to. <laughs> Love your enemy, said Jesus. Yeah, okay. And, and uh, preach the good news to all creation. Yeah, but aren't there some exceptions? Should we preach the gospel to enemy nations? Should we pray for the conversion of terrorists? All right, forget the dramatic examples. What about the family member you've had a falling out with? Or the sleazy neighbor across the street who just had his name in the paper for who knows what? Should you really care about whether that person repents or not? Aren't some people just beyond the call of repentance and the gospel? And so that's why Jonah says no and does not wish to go to Nineveh. In short, Jonah is a spiritual bigot. He figures the chosen people of Israel, well, yeah, but those people, no. Are they beyond the call of God's repentance? And Jonah says, no, 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 no. And so the reason Jonah says no is not because like Moses and Isaiah or Elijah or Simon Peter, that they feel he feels uh, unqualified or incompetent or even afraid. No. Jonah says no to the call of God because he's self-righteous. Because he thinks that there are some people who ought not be called to repentance. And so that's why Jonah says no. And it's, it's a deliberate disobedience. It isn't a snap judgment or out of disgust or fear. He, no. He's got time to think about this. Jonah lives up in gath Hefer, north of Nazareth. It's a 60-mile journey south to the seaport town of Joppa, where he's going to buy a boat ticket. It takes him two or three days to get there. He's got time to think about his disobedience to God. He has a choice. He can travel 600 miles over to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, modern-day Iran and Iraq, or, and this is what he does, he can go down to Joppa and buy a boat ticket to travel 2,000 miles to Tarshish in Spain to flee from the presence of the Lord, literally from the face of the Lord. Now, Jonah's not so stupid that he doesn't know that the one true God of Israel is present everywhere. He's even going to tell these heathen sailors that. But Jonah, when he flees from the presence of the Lord, is doing, as Martin Luther put it, 
He wants to go where the word of God, the worship of God, and the spirit of God, and the knowledge of God is not there. And that still happens. Somebody gets themselves wrapped up in a life where their fist is in God's face and they know that what they're doing is against what God wants. And all of a sudden, the voice of God becomes very uncomfortable. Church attendance may drop like a rock. The sermons and the scripture readings and the hymns and the prayers, the whole business makes them feel uncomfortable to be in the presence of God or the hearing of his voice. And so Jonah flees from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. A storm breaks out over this ship at sea. Out of a clear blue sky, the, literally, the Lord hurls a storm down on the sea. Even the heathen sailors know this is something unusual. They're old hands on the boat. They know what to do, but this time, no. And they cry out, each one to his own God, begging for deliverance. And then they remember there's something different or suspicious about this guy they took on board. This Jonah... Where is he? Well, he's down below. Sound asleep. We read in the Gospels that our Lord Jesus fell asleep in a storm once. But the reasons why Jesus fell asleep and Jonah fell asleep are miles, poles apart. Jesus, as perfect man, has a perfect trust in his heavenly Father so sleeps and as God holds oceans like puddles in the palm of his hand Jonah sleeps amid the storm because his conscience is asleep and it needs to be awakened and the sailors said to each other come let us cast, lot, cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah so they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This is what you learned in catechism class as the natural knowledge of God. These heathen sailors have. You and I are all born sinful at war with God. But we're also born with a natural knowledge of God. It is blurred by sin. Nor is this natural knowledge of God enough to tell you who the one true triune God is. Or what this God has done to save us by sending Jesus Christ as our only Savior. But this natural knowledge of God is enough for you to know there is a God of some kind and someday I will answer to him and there is a conscience that tells me this and a created world around me that testifies to it. And in the storm, that's what they sense. Perhaps at first they think this is no big deal. But eventually Jonah tells them what the deal is. He's running from the presence of the Lord. And what Lord is it? No, not a local God of the hills and valleys and the sea. But the God of the heavens who made the earth and the sea. And now they are terrified. <coughs> this terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Now his conscience is awakened. He confesses all. He sees himself the way God sees him, and that's what the law always does. It forces us to look in the mirror and see ourselves the way God sees us. 
so that we might look to Christ and the Father might see Christ in our place. So, Jonah confesses all. What must we do to get the storm to stop? Well, throw me over the side of the boat. Jonah is not self-destructive, but he knows why the storm has come upon them. He is willing to cast himself into the hands of God in order to spare these men who had nothing to do with it. His sin will go with him over the side of the boat in a far greater way. Our Lord and Savior, who had no sin, cast himself into the judgment of God and into the depths of forsakenness, his sin going with him so that you and I might be saved in the midst of a far worse storm. With might and main they will struggle not to follow his suggestion. Instead, men did their best to row back the land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. And they took Jonah and threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. They try with might and main to avoid doing the thing they just don't want to do, throwing him over the side. But finally they can't. And so they pray to Jonah's God. And over the side of the boat, Jonah goes. And the sea becomes as smooth as glass. Isn't it odd? I mean, these heathen sailors have shown more concern and compassion for Jonah than Jonah had for the people of Nineveh to whom God wanted him to preach. And isn't it odd that Jonah, the foot-dragging, reluctant missionary least likely to succeed, who did not want to convert the people of Nineveh, through his testimony, the heathen sailors on board that ship, are brought to believe in the one Lord of Israel himself and to pray to and offer up sacrifices to the God of Israel. But you say, yeah, but then what about the runaway? What about Jonah? The Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. The text of the Bible in both the Old and the New Testaments does not use a word that is equal to our word whale. It simply uses a word that means a big fish or a big sea creature. We don't know what kind. The Bible doesn't say. It says God appointed the creature, designated it. Did he even create it perhaps as a specific creature for this very purpose? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. We will get into this belly of the fish. Next week, you find yourself in the belly of a big fish on Confirmation Day. <coughs> but for now, here is the wonderful thing that is the glad news amid all the sad news of Jonah. The glad news is God our Savior will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The glad news is that even the unbelieving heathen party animals of Nineveh are not beyond the love of God. Nor was Jonah. Nor are you or I. Why don't we just stop running? Amen. peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.
Amen.
The annual examination of the confirmands has some salutary purposes to it. First, it does serve as a review for the congregation of a lot of biblical truths that perhaps have grown a little foggy over the years. It is also an opportunity for the confirmation class to demonstrate that they are ready to partake of Holy Communion, to properly examine themselves, because they've been taught the chief parts of Christian doctrine, and an opportunity in so doing also to confess their faith. We begin our examination by saying, even if a person never went to church or had a Bible, you would know uh, that there is a God. We call that one. Mike. The natural knowledge of God. What are the two sources of the natural knowledge of God? Make. Nature and conscience. Hebrews 3 4 talks about this. Hannah. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. And Psalm 19, verse 1 also talks about this natural knowledge of God from creation. Alice. The heavens proclaim the work of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. What does the Bible say about the atheist in Psalm 14, verse 1? Trevor. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. But what can nature and our conscience never tell us? Shade. What Christ did for us? We find that only in the revealed knowledge of God. And where do we find the revealed knowledge of God, Michael? The Bible. The Bible is not the word of man, but the word of God. What is the phrase we use to describe the fact that every word of the Bible is breathed by God? Matt. Verbal inspiration. And because every word of it is inspired by God, therefore, it is without error. What is the phrase we use for that, mate? Verbal inerrancy. 2 Timothy 3, 15-17 is one of the passages that teaches this. Joshua? And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All the scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Second Peter 1.21 is a similar passage dealing with the inspiration of the Bible. For prophecy. Michael. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men were carried along by God as they spoke from the Holy Spirit. What are the two main parts of the Bible? Sam? Old and New Testament. What language was the Old Testament first written in? Zach? Hebrew. And what language was the New Testament first written in? Trevor? Latin. The New Testament was first written in Caitlin? Greek? That's correct. And then, coming back to you, Trevor, 400 years later, the Bible was written in what language? Latin. What's the name of the Latin Bible? Anybody remember? Taylor? Okay. What language did Luther translate the Bible into? Aaliyah? German. And what's the most famous English translation of the Bible, sometimes called the Old Gold Standard? Nick? King's, King James Version. That is correct. Would somebody please recite the books of the Old Testament? Books of the Old Testament. Taylor. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Sephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And the books of the New Testament, please. Shane? 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. That is correct. What are the two main teachings of the Bible? Aliyah? Law and Gospel. Romans 6.23 is a passage that describes the two main teachings of the Bible, Hannah. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The entire purpose of the Bible is to show us how God sent our Savior Jesus into the world. Uh, can you please give me a summary of how God brought about that plan of salvation from the time of Adam and Eve until the time of Christ? Shake Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel, so God gave them another son named Seth, through whom the promise of the Savior was passed. Through the line of Seth came patriarchs such as Enoch, who was not because God took him directly to heaven, and Methuselah, the oldest recorded man in the Bible, 969 years. During the time of the Great Flood, the promise of the Savior passed through Noah. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The promise of the Savior passed through Shem. Eventually, the line of Shem came Abraham, the father of the faithful. Abraham's son was Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. The promise of the Savior was passed through Jacob, who was also called Israel. Israel had twelve sons, who became the fathers of the twelve tribes of Israel. The promise of the Savior passed through the fourth son, named Judah. But because of what happened to another son, named Joseph, the entire family went down to Egypt with, where they were eventually enslaved for 430 years until they were let out of their bondage by a man named Moses. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until they were led into the land of Canaan by a man named Joshua. And after the death of Joshua, can someone pick up that timeline at that point? Michael? After the death of Joshua came the period of the judges with men such as Gideon, Samson, and Jephthah. The last of the judges was Samuel, who anointed the first king of Israel, Saul, from the tribe of Benjamin. After Saul fell away from God, he anointed David from the tribe of Judah. David was a man after God's own heart, and he wrote many of the Psalms. David's son was Solomon, who built the temple and wrote three books of the Bible, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and Song of Songs. Solomon's son was Rehoboam. During Rehoboam's reign, the kingdom split Israel to the north and Judah to the south. This became known as the period of the divided kingdom. During this time, men such as Isaiah and Jeremiah did their preaching. Uh, in 722 BC, the Assyrians took away Israel, never to be seen again. In 586 BC, the Babylonians took the Judah away for 70 years. After 70 years, the Judah returned and built the, rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and the temple under men such as Ezra and Nehemiah. After four to five silent centuries, Christ was born in Bethlehem. What book gives us a summary of the main teachings of the Bible, Madison? With their small catechism. And who is the author of the small catechism, Zach? Dr. Martin Luther. And what are the six chief parts of the small catechism, Micah? The Ten Commandments, the Creed, Holy Baptism, Holy Communion, Keys and Confession, uh, Lord's Prayer. the Lord's Prayer. Okay, uh, let's briefly sum up the history of Luther's life before we move on. Give me the exact date of Martin Luther's birth. Uh, Trevor. November 10th, 1483. He entered the cloister at Erfurt to become a monk, Allison. 1505. Ordained as a priest, what year? Nate? 1507. Journeys to Rome? Hannah? 1510. The uh, exact date of the posting of the 95 Theses, Malia? October 31st, 1517. What is significant about that date uh, in this past school year, Sam? It is the 500th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation. Thank you. We celebrated that this past fall. Uh, the debate in Leipzig with Dr. Eck Joshua? 1519. Uh, died warms, uh, here I stand before the emperor, Nate? 
1521. Knight George of the Wartburg, Luther translates the New Testament. Allison. 1522. And he writes and publishes his first 24 hymns, Micah. 1524. Mary's Catherine von Bora, Hannah. 1525. Published the Large and Small Catechisms. What year was that? Caitlin? June 25th, 1530. That would be not the catechisms, but the Oh, that's correct, the Augsburg Confession. Uh, large and small catechisms were 1529. Roman Catholic Council of Trent. Name. Fifteen twenty-four. Name. Fifteen twenty-five. And the exact date of Luther's death. Allison? February 18, 1546. The New Testament uses certain words in regard to that plan of salvation, and it's good if we learn the pictures behind those words so that when we're reading the Bible, uh, those words aren't these simply churchy words that go flying over our heads, but they have some meaning for us when we read the Bible, especially in the New Testament. What is the word for declare a sinner not guilty for the sake of what Christ has done, Madison? Justification. God has declared the whole world not guilty, Nick. Objective justification. And an individual comes to enjoy this pardon for him or herself, Trevor. So, subjective justification. This is the word the Bible uses for the good news of what Christ has done for us, Taylor. Pascal. This is the word that means to trust in, to lean on, to believe in. Nick. Faith. This is the teaching of the Bible made up of commands, threats, and demands. Sam? Law. What is the threefold purpose of the law? Aaliyah? Curb, mirror, and guide. What is the word that means Christ made the ransom of his own blood to free us from our sins? Caitlin? Redemption. And God brought us into a state of friendship through Christ. The word for that is? Zach? Reconciliation. And this is the word that is used uh, uh, in the King James Version for the sacrifice of atonement. God's anger against sin, taken away, the blood of the mercy seat, and so forth. Aaliyah. Propitiation. And this is the word which has both a wide and a narrow use in the New Testament. In the wide sense, everything God has done to kind of draw a circle around us from eternity to eternity to save us. In the narrow sense, our grateful, broken Christian living, becoming more Christ-like, eh? Sanctification. This is God's undeserved love. It's a pure, undeserved gift. <laughs> Aaliyah? Grace. And this, these are the tools of the Holy Ghost, the gospel, the word, and sacraments, Trevor. Means of grace. Give me the three things that define what we call a sacrament. Hannah? A sacred act instituted by Christ having an earthly element and gives forgiveness of sin. And by that definition, what are the two sacraments? Like a... Holy communion and baptism. This is the word that means that the Holy Spirit turns us from unbelief to faith in Christ. Taylor? Conversion. And this is the word that means the Holy Spirit made us alive when we were dead in transgressions and sins. Madison? Quickening. And this is the word that means God gave us rebirth through the gospel. Sam? Regeneration. And this is the word that is a radical rescue out of a desperate situation. There was just no way out. Think of Moses at the Red Sea, huh? Michael. Salvation. That is correct. There are some uh, passages of the Bible that we sometimes refer to as classic passages, and we've asked you to memorize them because it's something that virtually all Christians should know. We ask you to memorize them in the beautiful language of the King James Version. Psalm 23. Nick Brownell. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou wilt thou prepare the table in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me the rest of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Another familiar passage from the lips of Jesus from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. Aaliyah. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am ye may be also. And whither I know ye know, in the way ye know. Thomas said unto him, We know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father but by me. It is only on this morning that the confirmands learn what part of the catechism we're actually going to zero in on this year. This year is going to be the Ten Commandments. The first commandment, Trevor. You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Isaiah 42.8 speaks of this event, Nick. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Deuteronomy 6 4. Allison? <laughs> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that comforting passage, Proverbs 3 5. Shame. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The second commandment. Sam? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear no God that we do not curse, swear, lie, or deceive, or use witchcraft, but call upon in his name, and in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. What does Proverbs 18.10 say about the name of the Lord? Micah? The name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run to it, and are safe. James 3.10 talks about the abuse of God's name, Hannah. Out of the same mouth come praising and cursing, my brothers, this should not be. And Psalm 50, verse 15, talks about the proper use of God's name, Zach. And call upon me, and if you have trouble, I will deliver you, and you will honor me. The third commandment. Nick. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching or his word, but regard it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. Hebrews 10.25 is an encouragement to us. Let us not. Joshua. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. The fourth commandment. Taylor. Honor your father and mother that I may go well with you and that you may enjoy the long life on the earth. What does this mean? We should fear love God that we do not dishonor or anger our parents or others in authority, but honor, serve, and obey them and give them love and respect. Colossians chapter 3, verses uh, 20 to 21, talks about honoring parents, children, <coughs> obey <coughs> your parents. Joshua. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. The fifth commandment. Madison. You shall not murder. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and prevent him in every bodily need. As we know from the rest of Scripture, these sins do not just begin with outward acts, but in the heart. 1 John 3.15. Michael? Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and we know that no murderer has eternal life in him. The Sixth Commandment. Sam? You shall not commit adultery. What does this mean? You should fear and love God that you lead a pure and decent life in words and actions, and that husband and wife love and honor each other. 
Hebrews 13, 4 talks about marriage. And one of the great blessings of marriage is spoken of in Psalm 127, verse 3. Sons, shape. Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children are worth him. The seventh commandment. Trevor. <coughs> You shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, that we do not take away our neighbor's inheritance or house, or obtain it by a show or right, but do everything we can to help them keep it. The Eighth Commandment. Alice. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, or give him a bad name, but Oh, no. But deep in him, speak well of him, and take his words and actions in the kindest possible way. Leviticus 1916. Micah? Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Proverbs 1113, Trevor. A gossip betrays a cop. A gossip betrays a cop. This a cop, and then a trustworthy man keeps a secret. The ninth commandment. The ninth commandment. Caleb. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or obtain it by show of right, but do all we can to help them keep it. The tenth commandment. Caitlin. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, workers, or animals, or anything that belongs to them. What does this mean? You should fear and love God that we do not covet our neighbor's spouse, workers, or animals, but urge them to say the duty. The conclusion. What does God say about all these commandments, Joshua? What does God say about all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all those who transgress these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his anger and not disobey what he commands. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should love and trust in him and gladly obey what he commands. This brings us now to the subject of Holy Communion for which we are preparing you. Uh, there are words by which Jesus instituted or established the Blessed Sacrament of Holy Communion. That is, this is my body, this is my blood. In what four places in the Bible will I find those words by which Jesus instituted Holy Communion? Michael. Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and 1 Corinthians 11. There are some other chapters of the Bible that apply to this subject, Caitlin. <laughs> Exodus 7, 24, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 John 5. What is the sacrament of Holy Communion? Aliyah. It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ for us Christians to eat and to drink. What does the birth is written? The Holy Evangelist Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the Apostle Paul tell us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Second, what blessing do we receive through this eating and drinking? Josh. That is shown us by these words, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Through these words we receive forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. Third, how can eating and drinking do such great things? Nate. It is certainly not the eating and drinking that does such things, but the words given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. These words are the main thing in this sacrament, along with the eating and drinking. And whoever believes these words has what they plainly say the forgiveness of sins. Fourth, who then is properly prepared to receive this sacrament? Madison? 
Fasting and other outward preparations may serve a good purpose, but he who is properly prepared to use these words, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. But whoever does not believe these words or doubts them does not believe, because the words for you require nothing but hearts that believe. We always want to partake of Holy Communion with a penitent, repentant attitude of heart uh, that matches up with the wonderful forgiveness Christ is giving us. To that end, St. Paul gave us a warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Micah? Therefore, whoever eats of the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. For a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Even if you knew nothing else about the gospel, but you had this one passage, which we call the gospel in a nutshell, you would know the main thing. And, and uh, what is that gospel in a nutshell? Zach. John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This concludes the examination of the confirmation class of 2018. the blessings of Christian education, and give thanks also for our St. Paul's members who attend Martin Luther College, Michaela Johnson, Rachel Kotek, and Ashley Urbanic, who has now graduated and was yesterday assigned to teach at St. John's in Nielsville, Wisconsin, grades 3 to 5 and music, and also for Mr. Jonathan Witte, who was assigned to Luther High School in the band department. Let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, who in holy baptism began your good work in our confirmands and has given your blessing to their training, that being instructed in the word of truth, they now look forward to their confirmation and to communing at your table. Cause their instruction to abound in blessings for their hearts and minds, that in the power of your Holy Spirit, they may confess their faith with joy and boldness in these last and dangerous days of a world grown old. Ascended Savior, we thank you that you have blessed the proclamation of your word by bringing our children to know you as their Savior. We also thank you for smiling upon our Sunday schools, our Lutheran elementary schools, and Luther High School. Bless all our teachers with a special measure of faith and diligence in their calling. Bless our students so they delight in your word and live their lives to your glory. Bless our families, so that the cares and concerns of this temporary world never distract us from the one thing needful. Bless the schools we build, not only the final phase of Luther's building project, but in building up our children's faith through your gospel in its truth and purity. Bless our members who are currently studying for the teaching ministry at Martin Luther College, and especially grant your blessing to Ashley Urbanic and to Jonathan Witte as they look forward to their new calls. We ask all of this in the name of our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
invite you to sign the guest register. We ask that you take note of the various events throughout the month as they are listed in your service folder. Please greet each other.